great. Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing this series of webinars now for almost two years, and this is webinar number 267. Um, it's really great that you are all out there watching the webinars on the YouTube channel, the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. Um, we have lots of great guests lined up coming up in March, so stay tuned. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, and of course, you can always subscribe to the Murdoch Method newsletter, and we put out a newsletter every Sunday with a list of guests for the following week. Today, my guest is Dr. Erica Latcher, and I'm so excited to talk to her. She has a podcast called From the Horse Doctor's Mouth, right? Straight from the horse doctor's mouth. Straight from the horse doctor's mouth. And um, she's been kind enough to come on today. And we're going to learn uh, all kinds of things because we've just had a great little conversation, side conversation before we got started. I'm really excited to introduce you to Dr. Latcher. So welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm really excited about this. You are very welcome. I, I am so sorry for all of you guys posting these really cold temperatures. And I promise that unless asked, I will not discuss the temperature in Florida today. Yeah. A good idea. So Dr. Latcher, give us a, like, um, you and I've been chatting a bit, so I know you're a horse crazy person like the rest of us. Um, were you born horse crazy? Is that, yeah, have you been, you know, like, when did you first start with horses? Uh, my parents are accountants. So <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't start with, we didn't quite start there. My mom had grown up with horses a little bit as a kid. And so one of her deals was when she passed her CPA exam, she got a horse. Um, which meant I got a horse and I was about seven or eight at that time. And I just started being, you know, the crazy barn kid. Um, I didn't do much as far as horses go for a really long time but in terms of formal stuff. You know, I did a lot of playing in the backyard. Um, and I think that's why I just really love horses, right? There was never any pressure to compete, nothing like that. It was just me out there being a crazy horse kid, having fun with my horse, doing my thing. So um, eventually we transitioned into showing a bit more. And, you know, when you're a crazy horse kid, you look at how can I transition this into a future career? And I said, equine veterinarian at the age of five. And here I am. Wow. So did you grow up in Florida? I did. I actually moved from the Tampa area, which is kind of middle Florida to Gainesville, which is North Florida to go to vet school. And um, once again, sorry for all you people with the cold temperatures. I'd never seen frost until I moved up here. Oh, wow. And it's very few people that are actually born and raised in Florida. You know, like a lot of the population is come theirs as opposed to born theirs. So that's really awesome. And so you went to vet school. You, you, I assume that you knew you wanted to specialize in horses straight away. Um, and did. Did, you, did you do any specialty work as well? Uh, I did an internship, which is very common in equine for um, veterinarians. And the biggest issue for, for equine veterinarians, I mean, there's a lot of issues we're facing today, but one of the issues we, we have is that when you graduate from vet school, as you know, for most of us, our veterinarian comes out to the farm in the truck. And as a new grad, that's pretty intimidating. You know, like I just graduated vet school. Let me show up on the farm and try and figure out what's going on uh, with, with minimal backup. And so for most veterinarians who want to do equine medicine, we do an internship. And that's what I did. Um, so I spent a year at a hospital in Texas where we were a surgical referral facility. So I saw uh, tons of colics, tons and tons and tons of colics, lacerations, you know, plus just lamenesses and all of that sort of stuff. Um, when I got done with that, I came back to the practice I'm at now. And, you know, I was like... I think, let me do general practice for a little while and see how it goes. And it's something that I fell in love with more than I ever thought I would. I, it turns out that I really value the relationship that I have with the client and, and the horse, to be honest, mostly the horse for a long time, you know, as, as the veterinarian, I have horses that I've now I've, I've made, you know, like they, I, I got the semen shipped in and put it into mom. And, you know, now those horses are 18, 19 years old. And I'm like, no, 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 no. They can't be that old. I'm not that old. Uh, you know, so that, that whole relationship of having that horse for its whole life and being there for that owner in times of crisis and times of joy, I, like, I really, really, really enjoy that aspect of veterinary medicine. So it's like, they're part of your family. Yep. That's really cool. You know, um, things are changing a lot. And like, I was talking to one vet and she's still paying off her, her 
student loans from vet school and it's gotten really expensive. So and this is kind of an aside, but if you were to tell, talk to someone who was interested in going into vet school, is there any recommendations you can make in terms of, you know, what that's like in terms of planning for when they come out and how they're going to make a living doing this job, which is a really tough job, actually. There's a few things that we like to talk about. And one of them is if you're getting ready to go to vet school. And we actually have a, a book as a total aside called um, How to Be an Equine Veterinarian that takes you through sort of the high school college steps in order to, to be a top candidate for vet school. But one of the things that you need to do is have a plan for how you're going to pay for it. And it doesn't mean you're not going to take out loans. It just means that you're going to set yourself a budget for when you go to school and you're going to be really strict about that. And then you're going to have a plan afterwards on how you really look at the amount of debt you have. And you have a very, very, very firm plan for paying it down. And it's yeah, just, because I mean, it's following like, your passion, is one thing, but having a plan is another. where can they find this book? Uh, it's on Amazon and it's also on our website at springhillequine.com. And uh, hang on, I'm going to put the title. Tell me the title again. How to be an equine veterinarian. How to become, sorry, how to become an equine veterinarian. I have it sitting over there. <laughs> that's, I, I didn't even know, you know, it was just something that I kind of thought I'd ask you about, but that's awesome because, you know, nowadays when somebody's going to pick a career, there's so much investment in time and money to, to get to that career. You want to make sure that you're really going to love it when you get done. Um, yeah. And on the owner side, you know, on the, the opposite side of that is the horse owner side. And that's where we really talk about, it, you know, kind of our, it, it didn't really mean to be a tagline, but sort of a tagline for our, our podcast that you should have a great relationship with your veterinarian. And what that means is that you've got an understanding and a plan for how much horses cost and how much healthcare costs for horses. And you know, if you've got questions or concerns, you talk about those with your veterinarian before it's two in the morning and you've got a colic and you're having to decide, am I going to spend $10,000 to save this horse? Right. Right. Like my cat Buster just, uh, I took him in for, cause his teeth smelled bad and it turns out he's got a major heart problem. And after going to the cardiac vet, you know, my cat costs more than the new refrigerator. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, you know, we, the cost of things now have, have escalated and they're only going to go up more with the current environment that we're in. Um, and so, um, you know, it is important that we plan and recognize what the costs are and figure out ways that we can minimize certain costs and plan ahead and set aside for those, uh, you know, emergencies when they happen. And one of the greatest things you can do and people don't always believe me, but from a cost saving standpoint and from an emergency standpoint is have a routine relationship with your veterinarian. We know you can get vaccines elsewhere, but having us out there. So we know where your house is in case there's an emergency. We know your horse, we know your environment. We know all those things. It makes sure that when that phone call comes in, we're, we're there for you. And you know, that's hard to say, but equine veterinarians have to have that downtime too. And so most of them have gone to, if you're not a routine client, they're not there for you at two in the morning. You know, that's just the way it is, unfortunately. Right. Um, but having that routine relationship, A, it'll save you money, you know, in the long run, for sure. The number of times we go out for every routine call, for example, we talk about what is your horse eating? Uh, you know, what are some little things that you guys have noticed about your horse? How are they performing? you know, just the day-to-day -day stuff. And we can head off problems at the pass with maybe just a teeny tiny tweak that doesn't even cost you any money. Yeah. You know, that's a really good point that you're making is, um, I I'm super fortunate. My horse lives at my vet's barn. <laughs> um, Mine and too. Yeah, exactly. And um, she's the one who actually told me to go and look at this horse. She thought it would be great for a client. And when he came home, he has never left. Um, and he's part of the family. And um, she's responsible for, for Al being in our lives. Um, but yeah, having, having that relationship is, we sometimes, um, you know, it's hard because sometimes you're thinking about the cost of things. But what you're pointing out is, that having that connection and that relationship with your veterinarian, whom in the good times, yeah, maybe you don't need them so much, but in the bad times, you really are going to need them. So developing that relationship ahead of time so that when that call comes in, they're going to pick up the phone and go, sure, I'll be right there because they know Absolutely. your horse. And that's a really, really good point. So um, 
and and you're also a horse owner and rider and competitor which is great so you're right in there with the rest of us struggling with the same things with all the things that's for sure <laughs> yeah so tell us a little bit about that how many horses do you have what what discipline do you ride um let me see we have we have four so here's the trick i have four on the property and then i have a few farmed out because <laughs> that way <laughs> It doesn't count. They don't count if they're out there. Right, right. <laughs> but we have we have four on the property, and then um, we have two donkeys who are fantastic. I highly recommend everybody look at donkeys as something they should have. Um, but one is my primary competition horse. Uh, she's relatively new to me, but she's a she's a warm blood quarter horse cross, which I have found to be fantastic. Oh. She has a great brain. Um, and then I've got one that is the result of my failed breeding program. So I wouldn't tell, uh, tell anyone to breed. In fact, if you listen to our podcast, we have a, uh, multiple breeding podcasts that start with don't do it. Um, so, uh, and then I have a, a retired off the track thoroughbred that was the love of my life. And he's, uh -huh. um, he's fantastic. Even though he is a walking disaster, <laughs> he has had two colic surgeries oh. and nothing about his airway work. So he's been, um, He's been a bit of an experiment, you know, uh, trying to find what bridal bit, no bit. It turned out a hackamore was the great combination for him. Um, you know, trying to manage an unmanageable really disease. So I, I really empathize with clients. That's for sure. Because I, I am in the same boat. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, so just to touch on this briefly, I'm so glad you brought this up about breeding, you know, because there's so many people that like have that wonderful mayor and, she, you know, she's not rideable anymore. So let's breed her. So just briefly, what is your basic advice about, <laughs> about breeding? Don't do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's going to cost you more time, more money and more effort than you ever thought it would. So, and, and it doesn't so much of what your mayor is great about has to do with a combination of nature, but a whole lot of nurture. And if you can't recreate that, you know, what I found is, so I have five foals out of this mare. Um, none of them quite do what I want. Um, at this point I could have bought, you know, the, the gold medal winning individual Olympic horse at this rate. I just was on the slow payment plan, but you know, I've got the one downstairs that, to be honest, I just didn't have the time to get her the confidence she needs to do what she does. I, I, she has value and she's here for the rest of her life, but you know, she just isn't what I want to do because I didn't have the time and the ability to put into her during her formative years versus, you know, the one I just got, I went out and found, uh, an eight or a nine-year-old. I think she was nine when I got her. Um, so, you know, relatively young, but old enough to know better. Um, you know, she has some holes in her that came from her previous program and that's okay. Um, I spent a bunch of time working on our connection. So I spend a lot of time with groundwork, The first, um, three or four months she was here, all we did was walk and trot. Um, we spent a lot of time in the halter and lead rope, wandering around the trails, you know, me just hanging out in her stall, uh, getting some of our relationship fixed and then off we went from there but you know i'm already competing her at a higher level than the one that i raised and it has a lot to do with honestly my ability to get the the other horse what it needed in the the formative years you know i just couldn't do it all and it's expensive to raise one well and and that's the thing is um First of all, you know, I can, I have a client, I can remember so clearly she was five foot and her foal turned out to be 18 hands. So, you know, completely unsuitable, but she bred him in, so she loved him. And so she, but it was such a struggle for her. So you, you can't predict what's going to hit the ground. Um, and if you add up all the costs and maybe you have a good number on this, if you add up all the costs from the breeding to the mayor pregnant to the foaling till they're five, what's like the average expense? cost of raising a foal from the mayor, not including the mayor cost, let's just drop that out to their five roughly. I mean, I would say you're probably easily in the, the seven to $10,000 range if you're in a cheap area, right? So like for me, where I don't pay board, I just have them hanging out on the farm and that's getting them to five and not including any time with a trainer. 
any time, you know, going to horse shows, learning how to see the sights and do the things. Um, you know, if you start adding that in, I mean, I would say I easily have 70 to 80,000. I try not to think about how much I have into the, the one I've got by the time she was five. And again, like it still wasn't enough for her. She's a horse that needed to go horse show a lot, like a lot, a lot yeah. to get that confidence at the low level. And it just never happened for her because I didn't have the time or the money or the, you know, I just didn't have any of it. And so it just didn't happen. So, so if you can it, split the difference, we said, say it's $35,000 because most people don't necessarily have the place. To, they could take that $35,000 to go out and buy a really nice horse that they could start competing right away if they actually did the math and figured out what it's going to cost them and the time it takes, you know, like a lot of, a lot of the women now, you know, we're older. Um, if I waited five years, uh, I'm not sure I'd be, <laughs> you know, ready to get on a five-year-old. Let's put it that way. Right. Yeah. And I mean, if to talk about the breeding, you know, a lot of us have this mare that we love and we, we want to breed her. Well, we don't start that process until that mare is, is 12 or 15, you know, they're getting up in age a little bit and sure I can get them. Well, sure. I can get them pregnant. Most of them I can get pregnant, not all of them, but it's a much more complicated process. And so even then we start talking about the thousand and eighteen hundred dollars per cycle, trying to get this mare in full. Um, you know, so you're looking at five or 6,000 for me to get her in full. And that's on top of your stud fee that you're playing plus shipping fees, plus, you know, all of that stuff. So, you know, I'm, I, I do breeding. I, I don't have a necessarily a problem with the process itself, but I think, you know, you, you recently did a show with spy coast farm and you look at all that they do for their babies to make them prepare to be happy, well-adjusted adults that are ready for us to show. And I can't even begin to provide that level of experience for them. Right. Right. So, I mean, I'm just really glad we're talking about this because it's something that I personally, as a, as a professional and an instructor, you know, I, I see this happen with clients all the time, less so lately, which is good. Um, but you know, that it's, you never know what you're going to get. You might not get a full that's ever going to be rideable you know, you might not have the environment where they can interact with other foals, which is so important to their development. Um, so I think that the, the words of wisdom coming from you are take that money, think about that chunk and go find a nice horse and start riding now, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And basically, I, I mean, I would say the nicest foal I had out of this mare that probably, you know, future casting is never a great idea on horses, but, it, you know, he had the personality, he had the looks, he had all of it. And he broke his leg at 18 months of age. Yeah. Cantering across the field. Like nothing happened. It just, he had a horse leg and it broke. Yeah. And that's, so, that is the other, um, <laughs> the other piece about breeding that can be so stressful as you've gotten it to that point and then something happens. So exactly. Yeah. Wow. All yeah. right. So let's talk about something a little, little more happy. Um, so you, you have been a vet in this practice now in, o, in o, um, Ocala, Ocala, right? Um, I'm north of Ocala. I'm about an hour north. I'm in Gainesville, Florida. Okay. And so you, you love your mixed practice and you decided to do a podcast about five years ago. So what, what was the sort of impetus to do a podcast? Um, I am a crazy podcast listener. Uh, my staff is probably tired of me saying, you know, I heard that once in a podcast. Uh, every time I say that, which is several times a day, they just look at me and roll their eyes. And um, I married this great guy who came with a bunch of audio equipment because he had been in a band. And so we looked at each other one day and we said, we should do a podcast. And I'm sort of the idea person and he's the execution person. So he pushed me to get it done. Um, and so now Justin is the host and I am the, the vet on the straight from the horse doctor's mouth podcast. And, you know, we were sort of like, well, what can we talk about? Like how many things do you think we can do? And it turns out there's a lot to talk about. So every, every two weeks we release something and, uh, a lot of it comes from, you know, what I'm seeing then around that time frame. Um, I'll come up with something that I want to talk about based on what I saw, you know, two days ago or something. So it's all oh, real life awesome. stuff. So, so it's kind of like your passion and the opportunity arose and you kind of put it together. And of course, during the pandemic now, um, things like podcasts and, and that sort of thing have become a lot. People know what QR codes are now. <laughs> <It's really laughs> 
<laughs> so there's been some good things coming out of the pandemic. It's not all all strife, but so so you've been doing this for five years. And what like what are some of the topics that you've covered um, in your podcast? Just so people can kind of get an idea. Uh, we've covered colic, um, both what happens, how to prevent it. Um, we've done, you know, kind of some different types of colic that horses get. Um, we've done some really great behavior podcasts. I'm really lucky to be near the University of Florida, and we have um, some really good relationships with some of the people over at the university. So we bring them in uh, to talk about their areas of exper expertise. So we've had a behaviorist on. Um, we have had one of the technical rescue people. So like, let's say you're in the dreaded scenario where you have a horse trailer accident and you need the, the really big technical, large equipment rescue people to come out and help extract your horses. Um, we had one of those guys on the, the show talking about how that came to be a specialty in, in fire rescue, uh, and some of the difficulties they face. We've done genetics. We have done, uh, a lot of diseases, a lot. <laughs> wow. We've done botulism, biosecurity, uh, strangles, encephalitis, uh, uh, the EHV or herpes or rhino. It has about seven names because us horse people have to name things weird. Um, so yeah, you name it. We've done a podcast on it. <laughs> wow. That's really awesome. Um, you know, because there's, this kind of information is so important for horse owners. And, you know, like we, before the show started, we were talking about botulism and I actually lost a horse botulism, which is like unheard of where I live in Pennsylvania. Apparently horses dying of botulism was not unusual, but here in Virginia, they had never seen a case before. So, you know, what, when that happened, it wasn't like I could go out and find a lot of information. Like, what do you, where do you find information on that topic? It's kind of a really, um, you know, it was so odd for me. Um, it's to have really that. odd here to have botulism. Like it's incredibly rare. And so, you know, trying to, to bring that information to Floridians for sure, but just to horse owners in general, because it is, you know, it's a disease that is, can happen anywhere, anytime. And it's such a, a tiny amount of toxin that can take out a horse. So right. our, our goal is to make the world a better place for horses. So we just look at whatever topic we can come up with that gets that done. Right. So are there places just because that, you know, I lost a horse too. Are there pockets where botulism is more common than others? Yes. And it is. So Kentucky is a hot spot, which is, you know, considering how many horses are bred in Kentucky. Um, but Kentucky kind of moving towards the East coast and then moving North, you were probably in an area of Virginia that just didn't quite have the right soil types, but there are areas of Virginia where it is common. And the, the difficulty is if it's not something that you see routinely, for instance, like I have to remind myself when I see a neurologic horse that it's something that's out there. The more common thing I see is encephalitis. Um, mm, right. But in the early stages, you know, botulism just and encephalitis and kind of any neuro disease can look very similar. So, you know, the hardest part for my job is sometimes keeping in mind what this could be. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And that particular summer when I lost my horse, it was like 109 degrees, like every day for weeks. So whether that had anything to do with it, you know, it's, we'll never know. Um, but you know, it's, it was one of those really strange things. So botulism is everywhere, right? I mean, it's in the soil. Yes. Um, to Ellen on chat, it is a, um, it's a bacteria that grows in the soil. It likes, uh, anaerobic conditions. So it doesn't like to have much oxygen. Um, and then it likes soil that is, um, really loamy and has a high organic content. So if you think about what happens under where we put hay bales in particular, you know, like, uh, if you're putting out large, large blocks or bales of hay and your horses are creating hay mats, that is an ideal location for botulism to grow. Yeah. And in my horse's everywhere. case, there was no hay involved. So that was another kind of really weird um, factor, but that is a common thing is I guess when people are feeding round bales, like we have since uh, vaccinated the horses against botulism or we did something. It was a while ago now, um, but that was, that's always the concern with feeding round bales. Um, so yeah, it's, it's some of these different sort of off the beaten path kind of things are really, um, 
you know, there's, it's great to have a source where we can find out more information. So I'm going to put you on the spot um, <laughs> because it just came up. I've been trying to find somebody to talk about HYPP. All and, right. And so, I, but I haven't been able to find anybody that I can get. So, um, but many, many people have asked me about it and I don't understand it. So I was wondering if you could talk to us a bit about HYPP, what it is and what we need to think about with horses with that. Absolutely. Um, so we did a genetics podcast with a geneticist at UF who has done some of the work on some of these types of things. And one of the things that we as horse breeders, overall humanity as a horse breeder has done, is we've brought along some characteristics that we didn't really intend to. And HYPP is one of those. And HERDA, H-E-R-D-A, is another one that we've certainly brought along. PSSM, or the polysaccharide mm. storage, is probably another where we selected horses with characteristics, they have these mutations. And so by continually selecting for these types of horses, we concentrated those mutations. So HYPP seems to go with additional muscling. And that is, if you think about the population of horses where this started, it was quarter horses that were bred for the halter classes. And they like those horses to have a lot of muscle. So, you know, they're, they're like these big bodybuilder looking horses. Along with that came this genetic mutation in the potassium channel in the cells. And so the way that muscles fire is sodium and potassium move back and forth across the cell wall. And in these horses, that doesn't happen correctly it causes the muscles to not fire correctly. The, the good news for most of them is that we can manage them with low potassium diets. And that is staying away from alfalfa. Um, you know, we go to grass haze and relatively plain concentrates. So like oats end up being a good one. Some of your ration balancers end up being good things. Um, typically, if I have a horse that we're having trouble controlling, I, I bring in an equine nutritionist to help make sure we have a good diet. Um, but it can be that as they get older or as stress comes into their life, for some reason that can also set off events. So for these horses, what I usually look at is trying to make sure that their, their routine stays pretty consistent, uh, that, and that their diet is very well controlled for potassium. And then we make sure that owners have, um, a couple of things on hand, but one is acetazolamide which is a diuretic that happens to cause the, the body to waste potassium. So you end up urinating out a bunch of potassium, which reduces potassium levels. So you can see why that would be helpful for these horses. And then we also make sure that they have syrup around all the time. So we usually make sure they have K-Row syrup or something really high, high sugar. And that has to do with how the body uses potassium to metabolize sugar. So you can give them a high sugar dose and it'll drive potassium into the cells and drop what's in the blood. Um, and that will also help these horses get out of an attack. Well, so it's basically, it's a genetic issue, right? We've bred this into horses. Is there some kind of a blood test or something? Like say, I'm going to go for a pre-purchase exam and I'm looking at this horse and he looks pretty meaty. Um, is there a test that I can do to find out whether or not he has this? Yep. Pretty readily. You can pull some main hairs. You want to make sure you get the roots. So I always make sure I, I do you know, 10 or 15 hairs, and then I pull really good and you want to be able to see the root bulb on the end of the hair. Um, and then I, you, you go for a total of about 50 hairs that you've got. I've never counted them. I probably always send them too many, but you want about 50. <laughs> um, UC Davis will do the test. Um, the quarter horse association, quarter horse paint and Appaloosa associations will all do the testing for you. It can also be done through groups like, uh, Etalon, E-T-A-L-O-N, they will do genetic testing for you. Um, and they can tell you if this horse is in fact positive for what we call the allele for HYPP. And they can have two copies of it. Um, most of the horses that we see out there are, they have one copy. So they're what we call NH. So H is positive for it, N is negative. So they'll have one copy that's normal and one copy that's abnormal. Um, the ones who have two copies of it tend to very readily go into symptoms. Uh, and so they're not, not such easy horses to, to kind of hide that they have HYPP. 
Um, I tend to see them in halter horse barns and the people who have them know that they're double positive um, versus like I have a, a client who bought one of these out of an auction. You know, she came from a kill pen, basically. We had no history on her. She was a paint. And as she got older, she started having these weird sort of muscle attacks. And so we went ahead and uh, tested her for HYPP and she was an NH horse. So we then had to manage her from there. And what kind of symptoms do you typically see with these horses? They get muscle twitches. And usually it's in the really big muscles of the hindquarters uh, because horses use those muscles pretty strongly. You know, what anything we do, we're usually asking them to push off the hind end. And those are huge muscles up there. Like one side of a horse's hindquarters weighs about 90 pounds. So that's wow. a lot of muscle. Yeah. Um, so when they're getting in and working with those muscles, they'll, um, they'll show us symptoms first and they get kind of these, um, twitches all through them. Um, you can also hear that they'll, they'll whinny funny. They'll make a funny whinny. And it's because the muscles that control the vocal cords aren't working quite right. And then if I put a stethoscope on them, I will hear that they often, if they're having an attack, they have an abnormality to their heart rhythm. Like it should normally be, you know, just bump, bump, bump these guys will be kind of, bah, 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 bah. you know, they'll be all over the place. Right. And so if I hear that, I know they're having an attack. And, and is this, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back of when I've gone over to Europe and I've seen some of these cows that they have over there that are double, they're massive. Is that sort of the same genetic in a cow or is this completely different? Yep. Same, same issue. And okay. I believe those cows have a genetic disorder, but I'm a really bad cow vet. So I can't tell you for sure. Yeah, no, I, I'm sure they do. But I mean, I can remember going to Belgium and they're white and they're, they, they just like, look, they have muscles where they, nobody should have muscles. <laughs> yeah. And if you look at like a, a fitted halter horse and someone says to you, oh, that one's probably positive. They, they mean it. And because you look at these horses and if you look at them next to another horse, it's not just that they have a ton of muscle, they have a ton of sculpting as well. So there's a lot of definition between the muscles. You know, there's just, just a lot going on as far as muscles go. They, they really look like Arnold Schwarzenegger in the eighties, um, looking, looking pretty impressive there. But like I said, along with that, because that's what we wanted as humans for these horses, um, we brought along some genetic mutations. And, and Herda, again, is the same way. What we found is one copy of Herda improves tendon elasticity so those horses are they tend to hold up to the training and the the showing better in the cutting and the the cow horse world you know where those horses have to kind of do the back and forth really fast and you know do a lot of of the shifting work if they have one copy it seems to promote happier tendons that handle that and so that's another part of breeding that, that we have to think about is what we're bringing along for the ride that we're not intending to bring along. What does HERDA stand for? Oh, Lordy. Hyperelastosis. Oh my goodness. Okay. It's H E R D A. That's, a, that's <laughs> close enough. Hyperelastosis something or other. Um, Cause that's when I haven't heard something of it. Something derma. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's very common in the cattle bred horses. Um, you know, like the cow, the cow breads, um, and I, common in terms of like, that's where you'll see it, but these horses get to be about two years old and you go to put a saddle pad on them and their skin comes off. So it's, it's devastating and lethal when they have two copies. Uh, and that's how we've kept it in though, you know, is that we've had the horses that had one copy, they were, they held up to the training and the showing better. And so we bred them, you know, before we had really good genetic testing. Uh, we didn't know, you know, so we just keep bringing these horses in and then eventually you get kind of the, the two copy deal. And that's probably what happened with warm blood and fragile foal syndrome as well. Um, I don't know if you, you've heard, I haven't of, heard that of that one either. either. What's that one? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. anyway, see our genetics podcast. Yeah. Um, but we end up concentrating these because horses who have the characteristics we want we perpetuate their bloodlines. And if they have a mutation, we end up concentrating it until eventually it's showing up enough in our, our horse populations that then we're like, oh, this is a thing. So. Right. And it's, you know, it's, it's interesting that it sounds like there's more genetic things going on than I knew about because I'm not involved with breeding. So of course I'm not paying attention to that stuff, but um, ECVM, I had Sharon May Davis on for a webinar. It's been my most popular webinar. And I am fortunate because I am heading to Aiken, South Carolina this weekend to do a dissection class with her. 
super excited about that. But, you know, ECVM, it's another genetic dis disease that we're seeing in horses. And it, apparently they're tracking it back to certain bloodlines way, way back. Um, and now we're seeing some devastating um, results from that. And that's uh, Edelon in particular. Is, it's just the one that um, our geneticist here at, at the University of Florida, she works pretty closely with them. Uh, Dr. Samantha Brooks is a geneticist here. And again, that's Edelon. Um, they do just the coolest um, genetics panel. Like I, I had no idea you could find out all this stuff. So like, for instance, my thoroughbred who has some pretty significant issues, uh, they can do a genetic test to see if he has appropriate copies of what they call the ROAR gene or, you know, recurrent laryngeal nerve issues in the throat. So not surprising, my horse has two faulty copies. And I'm going to tell you nothing about his airway works correctly. Um, mm -hmm. He also has one copy of distance and one copy of speed. So probably helps me a lot as a jumper where he's got a little bit of both of those muscle types going on um, versus like maybe if I wanted a barrel horse, I'd look for something that had two copies of the speed gene as opposed to the combo pack. Um, they're looking at one that has West Nile susceptibility. So this gene seems to indicate that these horses are more susceptible to West Nile and you want to probably make sure those guys are well vaccinated. Um, they have a new one in discovery where they can look and see if your horse has increased potential for being a non-sweater. And that's this a huge fat, deal. I, and I didn't think we we're going to get talking about genetics so much, but you know, this is fascinating. I didn't realize they have gone this far down the track in terms of decoding and determining, uh, genetics in, um, in horses. I know that like with dogs, they are doing a lot of typing to figure out what breeds and, and we're starting to do more of that in horses, right. To figure out, you know what your, what your favorite horse actually genetically, um, shows. And, and so is that all part of this, uh, or is this kind of two separate types of genetic things? One is looking for diseases and one is looking for, uh, blood, uh, bloodlines, or maybe it's all one. Edelon will do both. They have one panel that they call their ancestry panel, where they will look at, you know, kind of what makes up your horse. Um, and some of them go back to, you know, especially if you've ever done dog DNA, like it kind of goes back to breeds that don't necessarily exist anymore. So the Edelon group will do that as well. And, you know, so you'll see like Barb and you're like, that's not really like, there's a bit of that. Right. But it's not kind of a breed, um, that we talk about too much anymore, but that means that they have a lot of old Arab influence in them. Um, you know, so you can look at the breed makeup that that is a type of panel they do. And then the other type that they do um, does a combination of colors, like what color your horse is, which holy cow, is that complicated? <laughs> <laughs> Whoo. I don't even try to, to figure that out. People ask me like, what color full will I have? And I'm like, call Edelon because that's a complicated question. <laughs> uh -huh. Um, so, you know, the, it'll do a combination of what color is your horse. And then it'll do, um, I think it's 15 or 20 different genetic markers for performance and um, just things that you probably want to be aware of. Are these you know, like, is my horse expensive? prone to be non-sweater? Are the, are the tests relatively inexpensive inexp or price range? Uh, they're, they're around a hundred to um, like their, their cheapest panel for disease is around a hundred. Um, they go up to like 130, 140. So really not, um, so, I mean, I'm just thinking, you know, the person is going to go out and look at a horse and do a pre-purchase exam. Should we now start to consider doing a genetic pre-purchase to figure out what we've got before we buy it? Yeah, I, I did it post on the one I most recently bought, but, um, you know, I, I won't necessarily say that there were a lot of great things about the horse I recently looked at. And so I was going to buy her anyways but doing a genetic test on her helps me look and see, oh, you know, she does have, um, an increased propensity for, I can't even remember on her cause she's pretty perfect, but you know, like I, my thoroughbred, I, I would have known that maybe I needed to pay more attention to that sound he was making in his airway, that it was an indication that there were more things going on than just a sound. Right. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely something that I highly recommend in terms of pre-purchases is that, maybe not as part of the pre-purchase exam, but certainly relatively soon after you get one. Um, I do look at it where I do recommend it in terms of pre-purchase is if 
we have a horse coming from up north that has never been in the south, I will definitely have people do it to evaluate the potential for non-sweater. And that's in discovery phase right now. So it's not 100% is what that means. They're just not guaranteeing it. But it's such a big deal here in the South. And it's so miserable for the horses that we just want to know if that's an option. Right. Well, it's just really interesting because, you know, I've had other people um, on the show and um, the idea of doing um, annual foot x-rays just to make sure that your horse's feet are okay and here's yet another thing that we can do as a maintenance plan or a pre-purchase plan so that you know we're going to fall in love with whoever we get right that's the bottom line and sometimes we fall in love before we and then we buy them and then we find out like your thoroughbred maybe this isn't the healthiest horse on the planet but we're going to love whoever we get and if we can can sort of hedge our bets by doing some of these things to make sure that that horse is going to be able to do what we want to do with our horses. And it doesn't mean we can't change our plans, right? However, you know, we go into buying a horse because there's something we want to do, whether that's trail riding, show jumping, you know, whatever, dressage. And we really don't want to wind up in the situation where six months later, a year later, we find out, oh, wow, there's this factor that I could have known about and I, I didn't. Oh, and um, Ellen, yep, they do all this just by mane hair or tail. They actually prefer tail um, if you can do it because they just get a better uh, DNA sample from the, the root of the tail hair. So that's what they prefer. Um, and there's a couple companies out there that do it. We've just worked the most closely with Edelon due to their relationship with some of the, the researchers here at UF. But one of the cool things that I remembered when you're talking about trail riding is one of the things that they can test for, and they've got some really good work on this, is what they call um, the vigilance gene. And so they have, oh, I can't remember what it's called at the moment because I wasn't prepared for us to talk this this much about (laughs) genetics. But um, anyway, so there's two two versions of it, basically. Vigilance and curiosity, that's what it is. So two copies of curiosity are those horses who tend to be unflappable. You know, like they're the ones that the umbrella is waving in the wind and they walk over and touch it because they want to know what it is. And two copies of the vigilance are the horse that sees a plastic bag across the showgrounds and runs the other way. So if you want a trail horse, you probably want two copies of curiosity. And that's that they can determine in the genetics. Wow, this is really, really amazing. You know, it's like I, did, I had no idea where they were going this deep. And I, I know this, we, we weren't planning on talking about genetics, but I find it so fascinating. And again, I haven't talked to anybody else about it. And um, that is to me amazing that you can see a curiosity gene in the horses. And it was with um, like with my thoroughbred, he came back as one copy of each. Like he's curious and he's vigilant. And I can totally agree with that. Like that's actually, I made some predictions on him before I sent it off. And I said he was going to have one of each because he wants to look at it, but he's going to do it from over here. Yeah. And then he may go up and touch it, but he's going to take a minute versus like my new horse. She has two copies of curiosity and there is nothing she hasn't ever wanted to see and touch and put in her mouth. (laughs) Um, And I wouldn't think uh, Ellen's asking if it matters if the horse tail hair has two different colors, but I would think genetically it's going to show what it's going to show, right? Genetically, typically, um, in particular, if it's a paint, um, then you will see that they have some version of, of paint genetics. There are so many different versions of what they call, um, the splash gene, which is how you get like stockings and spots and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but typically they can find them. I do try if there's two colors, I will try to send them both just to see what happens. But um, in general, no, you can just send whichever yep. colors. Easy Rhonda's send. asking if you do a pre-breeding test. Um, she has a rescue mare that has no papers and she doesn't know anything about her breeding. That would be that ancestry test that they do. And um, they've done it on a bunch of horses. Kind of what they do is so like, let's say I send in my, um, my hair on my thoroughbred. And I say, here's my thoroughbred, here's his registered name, here's his papers, you know, so I know all the information about this horse and I, and I do, like, I really do know this. And so you say like, I'm, I'm a hundred percent positive that this is who his sire and his dam are. Like, I know this is who this horse is. And so that is what they use to kind of test these things. 
So they'll go in and say, all right, we think that we can look at this horse and say, all right, this is a thoroughbred. And so he should look a certain way. So then when Rhonda sends in her mare, that's a rescue, they can say, okay, looking up the genetic markers, it looks like Rhonda's horse has a little bit of thoroughbred, but it's also got some stuff that's like a, um, you know, a quarter horse over here and it's got a little bit of Arab over here. So, you know, it's, it's certainly not a hundred percent, but it gives you a good idea of what they're most of. Really fascinating. Um, and so I know that aside from all the genetics, you offer a lot of information for your clients on your podcast. And I know you're a fan of Surefoot um, and that you recommend like simple things that people can do rather than the big fancy high tech stuff. So tell us a little bit about, you know, what you explore, what you recommend, the kind of things that you're, you're interested in. I'm a, uh... I'm just, I'm kind of like everybody else in terms of the, the do it yourself or crowd, right? Like my horses live at my house. Um, I have to figure out when I have enough hours in the day to get them ridden and keep them fit. And I'm a big proponent that they have to be fit for the job we're asking them to do to reduce the rate of injury. And because I want to make the world a better place for horses an uninjured horse is more likely to do its job. And so it's more likely to get the care that it needs. So the more that I can keep that horse doing the job that we intended to, the longer it has a great, happy life. So I'm always looking for what are easy things I can do without adding a lot of time, but they give me a lot of value. So like the, the surefoot pads for me, the way I use them is I use them when I'm saddling up or unsaddling, you know, like I, I've trained my guys with clicker training, um, to stand on the pads while I'm saddling them, that that's their, their happy place to be. And then, you know, I can be brushing them or whatever, and they're doing their workout and I'm getting more into less time. I'm helping them build those supporting muscles and the proprioception and all the great things that your product does while I'm getting something else done. And I don't then have to get as much done in the saddle with other time, you know, like I'm basically kind of doubling up what I'm getting done. And there are so many things like subtle injuries that we understand much more have to do with how our horses carry themselves. So, you know, for instance, I had one where if you picked up a hind foot, he would pop out the opposite front foot and that's a proprioception issue. So that's leaving him prone to having a suspensory injury on the front legs because he obviously isn't able to properly balance when I've got a back foot up, he's not putting his front foot where it should be. So he's going to overextend and that leaves him more prone to low level injury, right? But low level repeated often becomes high level um, injuries of those tendons and ligament structures. So, you know, for him, I really worked on, can I pick up this leg with your front foot on a, a pad and teach you how to connect this? And again, it was something I could do quick and easy and didn't add a lot to an already full day, but got me a lot of bang for my buck on my horse. So I, I love, love, love balance pads. We use them a lot for horses that are rehabbing back from, from injuries, um, as a way to get them no concussion work back into their life. I mean, that's the other thing. You're not adding any kind of stress to the system that it can't handle, right? Like I'm not pounding on joints. I'm not pounding on ligaments. I'm letting that ligament or tend and learn what it's supposed to do in a very low stress environment so that it can, it can go back to where it's supposed to be naturally. Um, the other place I really like it is building supporting muscles. So we see a lot of, um, kind of younger horses that have difficulty maintaining their stifles in particular. And I really like putting them on hind foot pads and then asking them to having owners ask them to wiggle a little bit. And again, it's, it's bang for their buck, right? Like they can put them on those balance pads. They can be brushing them and they can just ask them to, to push off balance a little bit and catch themselves again. So everything I do, I'm trying to keep it simple, easy, cost-effective and double up my time. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. And that, you know, like I've taught riding for 30 years and that's kind of the basis of my teaching is low tech. Um, in fact, I, I'm probably going to send you something in the mail. I created something called look up glasses to keep people from looking down. Um, so oh, I need those. Yeah. Also, I'll, I'll send you a pair. You're going to love them and they're super low tech and they're so effective. Um, but you know, that's the thing is sometimes uh, people want to get involved with a lot of high tech equipment, but a, it can fail. It's expensive. You know, it, it's going to take time. And sometimes just the, the, 
the simple things in life are actually the, the more bang, but people like all the glitz of, you know, like something fancy. I, I you know, I, I see that all the time. I love a water treadmill. They're fantastic, but I don't have one. <laughs> right. Right. And, you know, I, I mean, the time and the effort involved for me to take my horse to a water treadmill, um, let alone, let's not talk about the money for me to buy one for my personal use. Um, you, you know, like you just, it's difficult for me to get done. And so something like this can really help me. The other thing I like a lot are things like the, the Equiband system where you do like the, the bands. I see um, Annalise's horses becoming swaybacked and the balance pads can certainly help. And I'm sure you have exercises that you talk about to help the core musculature, but a little bit of time with the Equiband system is fantastic. So I will put something like that on my guys and I'll go warm them up at the walk. You know, I'll do my five or 10 minutes of walking, working on getting them to do their thing. They're wearing the Equiband. And so again, I'm getting more bang for my buck by having them tighten that core while we're warming up or cooling down and they're getting extra conditioning that I don't have to put in at another time. Right. It's kind of like, how can you do something simple that, that doesn't take away from what you're going to do already, but enhances what you're doing so that you're not having to find more hours in the day, which of course, you know, that's always a struggle, especially for horse owners that have a full-time job and then come out to the barn and um, want to ride. Somebody has asked what you mean by copy A or two copies of it, like in the genetic markers when we were talking about that. So we each get two copies of genes. So we get one from mom and one from dad, and that's true for horses as well. And so you're going to have kind of slot A and slot B, and it's just what you have in what slot. So for like this um, potassium channel that is wrong in HYPP, you got one copy from mom and one copy from dad. So if one of those is bad, we call it H, which is positive for HYPP. And if it's normal, we call it N for normal. Or like the curiosity and the vigilance, same thing. Like you got a curiosity from mom, you got a vigilance from dad. So right. you'll have two of every gene type um, in your body. And so somebody's asking that her horses do therapeutic riding programs and she's looking for suggestions on therapy exercises to help them counterbalance the effects of unbalanced riders. I love your pads for that. I mean, love, 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 love. The other thing that has really been shown to be great in a therapeutic riding system, um, Colorado State has done a bunch of research on this, is um, poles in different patterns. So not, um, and not necessarily set patterns. So, but the horse having to think about where their foot is having to go next. And I do a lot of that work as groundwork so that the horse is kind of thinking about it without me saying, okay, put your foot here. I'm going to tell you, go walk through those poles and I want you to do it on your own. So kind um, of getting them to figure it out rather than making it too set so that they're in, more engaged in that process. Yeah. So setting your poles at not set distances. Um, but I, I, I call it tiddlywinks. So I just take poles and throw them on the ground and they have to walk through them. Having some raised components and some flat, again, all of that, just making them think about it helps them build what we call the multifidus muscles, which are the, the muscles in the spine that control whether your spine is straight. Um, they are teeny tiny muscles. And if you've ever had an aching back, they are probably responsible for it. It's my favorite muscles. <laughs> you're cute <laughs> and they're so fascinating in their in their ropey nature of multiple connections and you know that they've shown I, I remember Dr. Clayton was doing some research years ago now um, and, and they've done some work on rider stability and how important multifidus is and keeping multifidus healthy for human backs so obviously it's the same thing for horses backs that that's just it's a deep muscle, but a super important muscle for the overall health. And it's so tiny and it just amazes me what it does. On the, the rider side of things, what I try to emphasize, and this is the same thing that I do. So I try to do all the things I can with my horses to get bang for my buck, but for myself as well. Um, you know, it's, it's hard for me to stay fit enough. And so trying to be the most balanced rider I can and finding options for how to do that, you know, so um, figuring out how in my day, I add a few exercises that I've gotten from a friend of mine, who's a physical therapist, um, you know, really spending those five, 10 minutes that we're doing that walk with the Equiband on, I don't have stirrups on, maybe I'm trying to two point 
you know, really looking for how I can be the best rider I can be for my horse as well. Right. Cause that, I mean, that's so important to their back health. So um, when, when we talk about kissing spine and maybe this is a kind of a leading question, but do you think that, that it's because multifidus atrophies and then it's not keeping the spine stable enough and that's why we start to get this damage? Uh, it probably has more to do with the apaxial musculature than the multifidus, but you know, we can look at horses who are a year old and find that they have kissing spine lesions. This work is actually, it has been done where they've looked at young horses, x-rayed backs, and then sent them off into the world to do their deal. And lots of them have radiographic kissing. Now, um, kissing spine lends itself to so many descriptions, but I like to say that most of these horses are just giving pecs, not French kissing. Um, there's just a little, little peck of the cheek there. Not, not like full on, uh, you know, bad romance novel kissing. Um, those horses, they're fine. Right. And it probably has to do with that. They are trained appropriately to use their core to hold themselves up. Um, you know, I do think that a lot of these we can rehab through. It's just having an owner that has the time and the desire to get it done. Um, some of them we get too far and we just got to go for the difficult things. But I think if we can spend the time building the core, asking them to bring their abdomens up, really working on building that apaxial musculature. And sometimes that can't be done through riding. You know, these horses are too back sore. We've got to rehab them with no weight on. We start with that and then we go from there. But again, I do think that the more we do with like, you know, balance pad type work or any of that, that sort of thing that has been shown to increase multifidus cross-sectional area, we improve the ability for the multifidus to tell the apaxials what to do. The yeah, multifidus I, is kind of the brain. Oh, okay. I hadn't thought of it that way. Um, but I find it fascinating that they're finding uh, kissing, even if it's just little pecs on young horses that have never been ridden. It's yeah, there's, there's a genetic component to it for sure. Like, and um, so in my, my podcastness that I listen to tons of them. I love Dak Shepard's podcast. And he likes to say that nature loads the gun and nurture pulls the trigger. And wow. this is that case. So nature has loaded the gun for those horses to have kissing spines, but nurture has pulled the trigger. Wow. That that's a great way to, to think of that. Um, that's, that's quite helpful. Um, so tell us, you know, we're getting close to the end of the hour, but where can we find your podcast? You know, how can we learn more? It just, you, you know, just spending this hour with you. Um, what I'm realizing is that your podcasts are a wealth of information because you're super clear. You explain it really well. And, you know, you're, it's great. I, I just love it. Uh, we are at, we are on pretty much every platform. I don't know a platform we're not on, but it's straight from the horse doctor's mouth. Um, our website is springhillequine.com and the link to the podcast is there as well as, uh, my husband has written a couple of books. Um, one is the, he's got a series called the adventures of the horse doctor's husband. Um, and so those are on there as well. And then the, the clinic Spring Hill Equine is on Facebook and, um, the podcast is on Instagram as horse doctor pod. We have a TikTok video as well. I'm <laughs> trying I don't get TikTok at all. I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, we we're we're pretty easily find be able to find we're pretty easy to find as either horse doctor pod or straight from the horse doctor's mouth. That's awesome. I want to thank you so much for spending time with me today. So so I should send those glasses to the to the Spring Hill Clinic email um yep. mail address. All right. Oh, cool. I'm excited to try these. Oh yeah, I'll pop them in the mail. They're really fun and um you know, they're easy to use. That's another low tech thing. I've got another idea. I might send something else along with it um, to help you out, keep your, keep your core stability nice and strong. Um, because that's what I'm sitting on right now. And you'll notice I'm always kind of moving a little bit, which is what our bodies really need to stay healthy is movement. You know, that's so critical. Motion is lotion. Yep. That's great. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. And thank you everybody for tuning in. Just remember, you can find this and all the other webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. Uh, this is the last one for this week. We'll be back next week, but I am going off to the Sharon May Davis dissection and we might do something while we're down there. I'm just, I'm hoping I might be able to sneak something in. So stay tuned. We'll let you know about it. And thanks. Uh, just great to meet you. I really enjoyed this uh, spending time with you, um, Dr. Latcher. Thank you for having me. This has been amazing. Yep. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.